And welcome to another Scientology Outside of the Church podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Burke. We have two very special guests with us tonight. We have composer Jason Roba and the always titillating and surprising Scientology Girl. Say hi, Scientology Girl. Hi. Jason. Hey, everyone. Uh, John, Lisa, how are you guys doing this evening? Great. How are you? Pretty good. Real excited to get another podcast going here. It's always a, always a real pleasure to be working with you guys. Thank you. You too. So this is uh, going to be artists and suppression uh, as a general topic, and uh, LRH has a lot to say about this as far as why artists are suppressed by suppressive personalities. Um, and we covered a little bit of this in the blog last week. Uh, this was this podcast was generated more so by you, Jason. What was there any particular point that you wanted to launch off with, and then we'll just kind of take it from there? Well, I think all of our artists out there uh, who tune into our podcast will agree that as an artist, regardless of what medium you work with, whether it's painting, visual art, photography, music, dance, um, that throughout your career as an artist, it seems like no matter what you do, there's always a tremendous amount of pushback from individuals and society um, and other uh, you know, governments, whatever it happens to be there, there's always this, uh, this trend that we happen to run into with, uh, seems like everybody else doesn't want us to be artists. Scientology girl, what are your thoughts? Well, from my viewpoint, um, I think the reason why this happens is because if you think of all beings as basically good beings, right? And you think of the SP or, or suppressives and stuff, well, a suppressive person is out of valence. Now you go back to who we are as basically good beings while well, we're all creative. Um, so it's not necessarily just about the people who create art. I think you, even if you were a, um, let's see, like, like a, a coder, for example, you are still creating something. You're being creative in a sense, even though it's more, I guess some people would say logical, it's still creating something. Um, I think the suppressive person doesn't like people who are creative because he's out of valence, essentially. He can't have that, so he goes against that. Um, and that's kind of my take on it. How about you, Jason? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and there's just, there's this thing that happens here on this planet, or it's probably more than just this planet, but that we, we've got it, and you, and you mentioned this in your, uh, your um, tech blog, Jonathan, that uh, it seems like the leaders, the powers that be, whatever we want to call them, the controllers on this planet, um, they themselves aren't um, able to create very well. Uh, so when us, when we artists start um, creating something and taking society in a trend or taking other individuals in a trend, that's something that they can't have. And uh, they, they, they do a tremendous amount of suppression there to make sure that um, artists get uh, either usurped by them or politicized to push their agendas or just not is so that they give up on their career. So there's all the various trappings we can get into where, where they they, uh, they make trouble for artists, you know, to allure them into getting into, you know, drugs and drinking and, and into uh, low-tone behavior that, that ends up uh, ruining their career. But ultimately, I'd say that the biggest part of it probably comes from, you know, the controllers of this planet or the controllers of this this corner of the universe, uh, they themselves not being creative beings, and they want to maintain a certain level of control over all life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the creative spark is something that just can't be had within their equation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think an interesting Petri dish for this, and uh, this is right up Scientology Girls Avenue, is the current hullabaloo regarding TikTok. And that there's a very good chance that legislation will be put on the floor of uh, the Senate to ban the TikTok app in the United States. And this, this, is, this goes into not only the creativity and artistry, if you will, and, and you know, there's a fine line here on this, uh, that TikTok is being run by the Chinese government, not the company that made the code that creates TikTok. Uh, but there are a ton of creators on TikTok. Anybody, anywhere can come up with anything and put it on TikTok, good, bad, or indifferent. 
Um, there are many varying viewpoints on that. But for example, uh, it's being said, and this is, this is why I say it's a Petri dish, is because here you have a government saying, well, it's propaganda and the information that's on TikTok, for example, the positive information is it's the bleeding edge of, of news events. And, and, and I think you would agree, would you, Lisa, that it's one of those places where if you want to find out the truth about something that's going on or come up, come up with novel ideas on how to do something or somebody presenting viewpoints that you wouldn't normally hear, it, you see it on on TikTok first, even probably before YouTube. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, a whole lot of creators on there, and but I, I really think that the two are kind of separate from each other. Uh, you get people who you know would would do some dance things on it and would uh, show their their you know paintings, some sing, some you know there's there's all forms of artistic ability on there but i do think that the the news thing is, is sort of something separate and i think that's what they're really targeting um is is that they don't want people to actually have access to free thought mm -hmm. from other individuals because then what happens well it creates a, a sense of a community mm -hmm. and there definitely is a community on tiktok say so anybody can say what they like yes there are um things that are bad about it like um some I guess some people would call it that there's you know some misinformation on there, or some people are actually using it to fuel propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, but as for whether artists are being suppressed on there or not, if it was only an app for art and and creative expression, I think it would it would be very evident that it was doing that. But I think honestly, artists are suppressed a lot more covertly. Or it's the the normal um, suppression that artists face, like you know things like criticism, art crit art critics, and um, you know food critics, and these judges and all that. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a crock of crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I just can't stand um, the thought of somebody else evaluating and invalidating somebody's unique self-expression. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what that expression is. Yeah. I don't think it makes people grow. I don't think it, it helps in any way. Yes, I agree that adversity does help uh, strengthen character and, um, you know, all of those good things. But I think if you're an artist, the best way that you can move forward is just to stay in aesthetics. Um, as soon as you drop down to, you know, lower tones because of that criticism, you get into trouble. Um, and I think that's why there's this term, the broke artist, is because there's so many people that are critiquing. But I think the more important thing, and I'm sorry to hog the mic, but um, the more important thing to think about is just artists, how they should actually guard themselves towards this kind of um, treatment, towards these kinds of criticisms mm, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, they should be educated on it. Yeah. Definitely. Jason? Yeah, Lisa, I really like what you said there about critics, because that's, that's always been a, a bone of contention for me, uh, especially within within music. Uh, there, there are good music critics out there, but, but that's not the majority of them. And something that I've, I've noticed with, with a lot of art critics, whether it's music or food or, or any of the mediums that you mentioned, they, they go around and, and they, 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 they tear up um, young or aspiring artists uh, to ruin their career before it gets off the ground, essentially. But then the other thing I do, with the, uh, excuse me, not the thing that I do, the other thing that they do that I've noticed is that they prop up art or um, food or whatever it is that, that isn't aesthetic. That's one thing I've really noticed with music critics, especially in like, the orchestral music world. Uh, they'll, they'll tear up somebody's composition uh, verbally um, that's actually a tremendously beautiful and aesthetic piece of music but they'll promote something that, that has no, you know, on the other hand, they'll, they'll promote something that has no beauty in it. That, you know, they'll, they'll call it something maybe extremely experimental uh -huh. and uh, that, that has, you know, nothing catchy to it, no earworms, no, uh -huh. <laughs> nothing that, that, that's, that's enjoyable to listen to and is absolutely not aesthetic whatsoever. And then they'll encourage uh, composers to, to create music like that. I, I don't know if you see that at all in, in the visual art world, Lisa, 
or Jonathan, if you've seen anything like that too with music critics or, or any other critics that you've noticed, but it seems like what their definition of aesthetic is um, falls falls short of what we what we would consider to be aesthetic. Yeah, well, that's it's it's one of those things where you almost feel like, and and I, I hate to use the word again, but there's there's some sort of an agenda on what what direction things should take as opposed to just validating an artist on something that that they do uh it always seems like there's some sort of underlying theme as to well what's what's the big machine as far as with music uh for example what the big machine wants the direction to be and you know i mean it's it's Prince was saying when he was still alive that he was tired of um, what's what's the name of the artist the uh, I am the tiger uh, you're gonna hear me roar Katie uh, Katy Perry oh. Katy Perry he was saying this was before he died he said I'm tired of having Katy Perry shoved down our throats because you have these big machines that are put pushing these artists everywhere. I mean, even when I was a kid in the 80s, I hear songs on the radio and I still switch them off because they were so overplayed. But it wasn't things that I that I liked. You know, it, at some point people realize that the things that they like are different than what the 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 mainstream is being is pushing down our throats. I mean, how many years have we watched these gals walk down the runways of these these major Italian fashion shows and every year they get more bombastically outrageous in the things that they call fashion and that nobody wears right and then you've got uh, you've got actual clothing designers on etsy making uh clothing that that women actually enjoy that people actually enjoy and then you know they're not getting any uh any spotlight but you've got all these these other just quote-unquote designers who are making these outlandish things that, that nobody really would like to wear and absolutely can't afford to wear. Right. Well, I mean, and, and Lisa, that's, that's you know, I mean, that's that's the area. She, she has she has an Etsy store and she 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 makes designs that that uh, other artists take and put together with other things and and they sell a lot of merchandise. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's sort of like, well, this is what's popular and this is what people like. From my standpoint, uh, what I've seen is that. You know these crazy things that we see, like what you what you guys yeah, are talking about. Yeah, a girl wearing a box. The, yeah, <laughs> that stuff. And if you just type in art in Google, mm -hmm. it's gonna give you the most outrageous crap. I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. and I know art is subjective, and I'm not supposed to be a critic here. But honestly, there are some things that are just like, how is this, you know, beauty? Mm -hmm. um, so. All of those things, especially when you get to things that are um, higher priced, because you, you won't, a lot of the time, you know, like these people that have exhibitions and stuff, like they don't have beautiful stuff. They have, you know, a lot of not so great stuff, mm -hmm. but selling for millions. Mm -hmm. And you ask yourself, why? And why is this? you know the runway thing mm -hmm. well i mean look at the stars look at sam smith as well the yeah. new artist thing and he's yeah. wearing the weirdest stuff right now mm -hmm. my theory is that it's just these crazy people it's not the whole world yeah uh, when i first went on tiktok like i expected there to just be a whole lot of idiots making content but when you look at all these platforms that actually have um you know, where it's open access, where people, anybody can just make something. Mm -hmm. You actually see there are so many creative, brilliant, talented, crazy good people out there that are creating this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, like, how, how, you know, why are these people, the Sam Smiths of the world, why are they so successful and that's where the money's at, whereas these extremely talented people, they're just not, you know, making it. Mm -hmm. And and even if you're a content creator and, and you have a million followers, you'll be lucky if you get a an average wage from that because it's it's just not livable. I mean, okay, if you're like PewDiePie, it's different because he's got like millions. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah, yeah, it's millions. <laughs> but yeah, millions it's a lot. Millions. Yeah. Anyway, 
basically from my standpoint um it's not everybody i know that it would like to seem like everybody but i think it's literally just a very small probably one percent of the population uh, the only difference is that they have the means to show and put the stuff out there. Yeah, well that's, and that's what I was saying in the, in the, you know, that article that I wrote, that blog post article, and the others on uh, the, the deeper, darker intrigue. It's not whether you or I believe it. It's that they have the money to push the agenda, like uh, to come back to Sam Smith. Jason, feel free to chime in on this too, by the way. At the last Grammy... Uh, awards that happened about two weeks ago. I think it was a month. A month, yeah, it was yeah. a while back. I mean, there was so much uh, Satanistic symbolism in that whole thing. It wasn't even funny. And then on top of that, you have the, the halftime um, event at the Super Bowl, where, I mean, the, the symbolism is just all over the place, and, the, and that they're, they're, they're pushing this stuff so, so hard. And that, that's because, and the reason why I bring this up only for this reason is because that's the agenda they're trying to push. Whereas somebody that is selling something that is truly aesthetic and is, is and to use a Scientological term, keying people out, barely gets noticed because that's not the agenda that, that they're wanting to push is they're wanting to re-stimulate, which is how I started the article out in the first place, is they're wanting to re-stimulate they're not wanting to key out. They're not wanting to inspire people to do anything other than what they want to inspire them with, which is negative. Yeah, I Lisa. mean, sorry, just one, one thing on that. Um, if you look at music, the music industry, mm -hmm. it's just trash. <laughs> well, if, you know, Jason knows. <laughs> if, if, yeah. we, if we go, like... I cannot think of a song off the top of my head that's been within maybe the last 10 years that actually promotes anything beyond the second dynamic. If I can think of like one or two songs within the third dynamic, it's a lot. And, and you know, I mean, okay, yeah, you do have religious music, which is like seven and eight, but mm -hmm. um, anything below that it's just non-existent <laughs> yeah, what about yeah. teamwork what about mankind you know mm -hmm. i would love to hear a song where there's a whole animals? bunch of people yeah <laughs> right i would love to hear a song about like with a whole lot of people like a choir that's not singing about god I i'm sorry but like you know just them singing about unity and community and mankind and and that sort of thing i think it was it would be beautiful and I personally have never heard such a thing. Mm -hmm. Jason? Yeah, or even, even a, 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 a singer-songwriter or a, a vocalist actually writing a first dynamic song about overcoming adversity, overcoming uh, you know, overcoming trouble on the first dynamic, that's something we don't even hear about anymore. <laughs> right. The, the first dynamic ones that there are is basically like, uh, oh, I got money, I got bitches, whatever, you know? Like, it's, have, have, have. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I listen to. Well, you, you like Dream Theater, and and which is you know is is prog rock, and I like Rush, and I enjoyed Rush, and I really got into it because it was very, the the lyrics written by the drummer. Of course, you're a drummer as well, Neil Peart. The lyrics were always very thoughtful about the first dynamic. They were usually from a, a first dynamic. To a third dynamic viewpoint but in like lisa with, is, is saying how often in popular music do you hear anything about the third dynamic yeah, yeah or, or or the seventh or the eighth dynamic without it being you know uh, way over the line and in with the prevalent religions on the planet not that there's any problem with that but it's it's one of those things that you just you don't see we were lisa and i were commenting a few months back she was she has some, some uh, clients that listen to country music, so she was listening to some of the music, the, the, the artists that they were recommending. Every single song, and this is, I'm not making this up, every single song mentioned alcohol. Yeah. And most of them also mentioned drugs. Yeah. I mean, one for one, it's as if they're promoting this stuff, and these are the guys that have record contracts. Now, granted, I mean, we could get into the whole thing about, you know, how diabolical recording contracts are these days. But 
And that's part of the suppression there is that these guys have to do whatever they can and they sell their souls to the devil, no pun intended, um, because they want to make it big, like I mentioned in the article. They'll do anything and they'll mention anything. You know, the A&R guy comes in and says, put something in there about alcohol. That'll help it sell. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think that that, I mean, how could it not be that, you know, it's almost like they have a, a bullet list. It's got to mention this. It's got to mention this. There's so, it's so formulaic. Do you see that, Jason? Yeah, and, and, and more to that, rather than having the A&R guy come in and, and uh, make a suggestion, they've got, they've got ghostwriters who will take, you know, your demo and then they'll make up another mock-up of it with those um, those points. Exact, yeah, already put into it, already uh, with the correct amount of syllables and you know the correct emotional uh, impact. They'll already have someone that's ghostwritten it. So that, okay, you know now do it the way you know your ghostwriter just uh, just uh, mocked it up. <laughs> it's 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 pretty terrible. But no, I, I like what you're saying too about about Rush, Jonathan. Uh, You've got that nice quote from subdivisions in your in your tech blog. Be cooler, be cast out. <laughs> you caught that. <laughs> I, I love Tool. Excuse me, I love Rush and Tool and Dream Theater. That's yeah, Holy Trinity. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and and you know that's that's the whole thing is that, and this comes full circle back to, at least in 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 the music genre. I mean, um, in, in Lisa's line of work, she doesn't. I mean, she has she she creates art that that people request because it's what's, I mean, you know, what's popular? What does popular mean these days to you as a, as a digital artist? What is popular? Whatever's selling. Okay, but why do you think, and Jason, feel free to chime in on this, you know, it's, it's okay to, to, to jump in and say something here. But what is, what is popular, what does that mean? Is it, is it bank it's, agreement? Is it what? It's reality. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's for me, it's just, it's just reality, really. Um, so, you know, if, if people are wanting, like, like in mine, I, you know, do a lot of um, designs with things like skulls for guys and, uh, I don't know, um, animals for girls or animal print for girls and stuff it's just like you know global agreements kind of thing that these things are hot and popular mm -hmm. um what do you think the prime reason is though i mean is there any any it's just what they're around it's, it's just it's, it's, whatever it's their they're... reality yeah mm -hmm. so if, if you had a different clientele they would want different things than Absolutely. people from that geographic Absolutely. location i i have i have for example this um, I can think of at least three different customers who the one just wants prints of like cows and um, you know cowgirl hats and cowgirl shoes and she's from the south and I'm sorry to be stereotypical but it is what it is uh, then I have another another one and she's actually a close friend and um, she's in Canada and she loves you know mountain life and uh, trees, evergreen trees, and that mm. sort of and thing. That's rivers what sells and their nature. Yeah, yeah, it does. So, I mean, in Africa, you wouldn't expect southern things to sell here. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, you would maybe probably, leopard print. Yeah, maybe <laughs> leopard print. And, and I actually have a lot of leopard print shirts, <laughs> but um, we really, I mean, our kind of thing would probably be like, like, I mean, even on this shirt, right? I have this, um, you guys can't see it, but on the shirt that I, I'm wearing, it's an African girl's face. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's what sells, that's what's popular. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's for me all about reality. What is around them? Right. And getting back to the suppression, uh, I think they use that kind of thing mm -hmm. to actually um, steer the rudder of yes. the of the, of yes, the, for the board of, of, for, yeah. for propaganda. I mean, okay, uh, I'm sorry to any listener who is um, Christian or Catholic or religious at all, um, but this is just my viewpoint. But you look at the the one song. I think it's from Stormzy. Um, it goes, Lord, I'm not worthy. You know, all of that. And, and the lyrics are suppressive. So, and when you say suppressive, 
how that you're that it's it's well, an it's, agreement it's, it's that like you're, an you're, implant you're, the whole time you're low Lord. and, and yes. you're not you're not worthy firstly and, you have to be subservient to something mm. secondly you're not worthy mm-hmm. um more lyrics uh you fix me so you need something else to fix you mm-hmm. um you came and saved me so you need something else to save you so you can do none of those things by yourself and it's those kinds of lyrics that you need the that, help from somebody exactly yeah. and it keeps you stuck keeps you stuck yeah so um mm-hmm. it, it, there's more than one way which music can be suppressive and a lot of people like that i mean it's it's a very catchy song but you don't realize what you're doing and I, I on I haven't got a lot of um, like experience or knowledge on this type of thing but there was something that I read recently about how wavelengths can affect uh, the mind and um, you know like like obviously there's this positive and negative now within music there's positive and negative as well because it's, it's waves uh, frequencies and that sort of thing Ooh, now, that's some, that brings up something else I wanted to ask Jason about. Don't let me yeah. forget. Okay. okay go ahead. So um, there's obviously all these frequencies and stuff, and I don't know what the effect of those things are when you mix them with lyrics, but um, I do know that listening to certain music makes me feel a certain way, and it's not necessarily all about the words. Um, so that's another way I think that it can be a bit suppressive. Uh, I mean, music as well. If you think about, you know, love songs and stuff, um, when you get to like the second dynamic, I mean, there's so many songs out there about the second dynamic that's just very sad and breakups and stuff. I mean, is it a wonder that we have such high, um, you know, divorce rates and, and stuff? I mean, this stuff does have an effect on a person. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean you know. Lisa, I mean, you're, go ahead, real Lisa. quick. There, you're you're you're, you're talking into in, into a realm that uh, really fascinates me when you're talking about um, music and particular choice of words and particular choice of sounds and how they can control people's emotional states, emotional tone. Uh, you know, all the MK Ultra, uh, as as Howard would call it, pain drug hypnosis stuff. Oh, there's a tremendous amount of that. You're, you're talking about certain sounds and the way that they affect you. And yeah, there's absolutely things like that that they can use. In the recording industry, with, with frequencies that are outside of the human hearing spectrum mm-hmm. uh, that are used in there to, you know, and then uh, you combine it with images when, when, you know, we're watching Netflix and uh, some of the other streaming services. And absolutely, there, there, there are patents that I could send you uh, for, for this technology of how they're able to uh, manipulate people's, um, you know, that, that, uh, you can look it up and they'll call it, um, there's a three letter acronym that they call it, I'm trying to think of, uh, NLP. Neuro linguistic programming. I'm sure the two of you are familiar with yeah. that. Mm-hmm. But uh, there, there are many things within NLP that are used within mainstream media, and it's it's hypnosis. It's uh, programming. It, 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 <laughs> That's why it's called know, programming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Right. Exactly. So anyway, I wanted to chime in. Lisa, you said that and that that piqued my interest because that's you know I've got track with with many incarnations with with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's easy to see that with television and movies and movies are you know they're they i was have, just about to they, mention that yeah yeah that clearly there is a direction that that things are heading to get people to think about certain things talk about certain things have a drive towards certain things and one of the things i wanted to bring up real quick and i don't know if you're you're familiar with this jason Uh, And this is in line with what Lisa was saying as well. Uh, There was a TikTok video, and I'd heard this before somewhere else in writing back in the 90s, that music was, and I'm a drummer, so forgive my, my stupidity on this, but they changed the way music was done as far as the range that it was done in, in order to make it more depressive. Does that ring a bell to you? Now, I'm not talking yeah. major and minor key. Right. The I'm frequency. T- the, the frequency of it. Do you remember, have you heard about the this? Frequency. Yeah, yeah, when you were talking about, when, when you're referring to tonality, if something is in A440, yeah. 432. Yeah, what's yeah. up with that? There, Can there we get into that for a minute? Because that's suppression mm-hmm. also. Can you can you explain that to us real quick for our listeners? 
So to use it in very basic terms, um, the fundamental frequency in which a particular instrument or recording is based off of would have either a center tuned to a particular frequency, in which case is usually considered 440 hertz when you play A below middle C on a piano. Now, that was allegedly done to be a standard for all instruments after World War II, or around World War II, around the world, to be tuned to A440. Uh, that way, you know, if you have pitch percussion instruments, if you've got you know, different manufacturers from around the, the European countries all making a standard, allegedly. Mm -hmm. Now, or then, you typically had tuning down lower. Uh, you'll hear a term, if you Google it, it's called the Verdi A, as in the composer Giuseppe Verdi, uh, which is 431 hertz, or 431 cycles per second, which is lower uh, than A440. And allegedly, that is the uh, fundamental frequency that the mass universe or the physical universe resonates at. It's a harmon an upper harmonica, but obviously the frequency itself would be so low in cycles, it would probably be uh, years or decades um, that you could measure the, the the period of the wavelength. Uh, you know, we measure things in cycles per second. There, right. The the center of the mass universe probably resonates at something in, in, in eons that we, we can't fathom. But the harmonic of it that we can perceive uh, with our meat bodies uh, is A431. Now you can take, uh, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there where they, they tune a various uh, piece of music from 431 up through up to probably 445 down to 431 you can hear it that sounds different now the only thing that i have to say about that is nothing hardly any music you'll hear in a recording actually is done at 440 unless it's electronic music uh most rock music is down in around 8436 mm -hmm. um, that's why if you try to play along with your electric piano to any rock music you'll notice that your piano is your electric piano is slightly higher then what you're hearing, you know, you, you'll you'll see, oh, it's in the key somewhere between E and E flat. <laughs> it's 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 in between the notes. If if you listen to you know say a Rush song and you try to play along with it on an electric keyboard, you'll notice that Rush is playing down, you know, uh, maybe around A four thirty eight, A four thirty six. You know, mm -hmm. Muse they tune down pretty low, uh, four thirty six, four thirty five. I've heard it as low as four thirty two. Um, but anyway, yeah, that that's something that's changed. Uh, Music is more resonant with the meat body around 431. That's why Giuseppe Verdi discovered Giuseppe Verdi standardized this tuning. Uh, so it, they call it the Verdi A. Uh, most orchestras nowadays in Europe you'll find tuning up 442, 444, and above. So it's very rare to find anything that's actually 440 unless you're listening to EDM, which you know all those software instruments. You know even the music that I compose for production music has to be at 440 because they need to be able to. Uh, edit this with, with commercial software, and all commercial software is, is typically tuned to 440. So I know that's that's a long roundabout uh, way, and I threw a lot of significance in there. Uh, hopefully nothing too arbitrary. Can you, can you just, um, what were you saying about EDM? Because this is funny, I actually really like EDM. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I grew up on this stuff, and part of the reason why I like it is because a lot of the music doesn't have lyrics. So I know I'm not being imprinted in that way. Yeah, oh, I know. I, I love EDM and Dead Mouse and Tiesto. And, you know, I, I love a lot of synthesizer music. And uh, yeah, same thing. I, I don't like much EDM that has any vocals in it. So I agree with you on that. And uh, typically you'll find that it is tuned uh, to A440 just because the instruments, you know, a lot of the synthesizers that were designed in that era um, coming out of the, the 70s and the 80s, uh, they came from the factory tuned to 440 hertz, mm. um, you, know, you know, if you go and if you go and pull up a Dead Mouse song right now, a Dead Mouse track from 10 years ago before he started using the lyrics, and you, you go to, over your electric piano if you have one, and, and you find the, the center of where the the tonality is, and go, okay, that's in 440, uh, and that's just because of the the equipment that was available to those artists. Um, you know, a guitar player they can get their get their guitars and tune them down. To 436 very easily. It's not very easy to tune in a synthesizer down. Yeah. Um, especially analog synth. Some of them you can, but you know you're, you're not going to find. You know Joel Zimmerman's not going to. You know Dead Mouse. He's not going to go down tune everything he has down. To, and I, I imagine like if he if he were to do that, it'd sound pretty cool. Uh, you know I, I would love to take some of his music and and, and detune it to see what it sounds like at 431, for instance. Um, well, but, it, yeah. You'll, you'll, oh, go ahead, John. Well, I mean. 
what do you, what are your thoughts on this as far as it, well and you know I understand the the synthesizers this I mean your synthesizers started showing up as early as uh, the early seventies and and they were still using these tunings that had been changed twenty twenty five years earlier so it's not across the boards that there's there's this suppression in these tunings but. For example, like in, in EDM, they're still using they're still using Oberheim synths from the '80s and uh, Prophet Five and you know, uh, all, all you know Jupiter Eights and stuff like that. I, I don't I don't know the software versions of these things that they sell now. They're probably using the software versions because some of these keyboards, I mean, their longevity is 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 either gone or waning because you know. Electronic parts, you know, solid state parts only last so long with electricity flowing mm -hmm. through them and everything. But what do you what do you think this has a, its effect has on people when you're you're dropping these tunings and things like that? From well, if you listen to stuff from the '40s, like let's say uh, somebody popular like Benny Goodman, for example, uh, you know, it, it seemed it seemed alive and it seemed peppy and all of this stuff. And then you get into the '50s, and it seems like the tone level of the music dropped. Is that because of this change, or is that just because rock music and Elvis came on the scene with Chuck Berry and Fats Domino and all this stuff, and and so we're dealing with a different genre and a, a different influence as far as popular music and popular culture goes? You think it was intended that way, or it just happened? I think the suppression occurred in other ways. I, I don't. I, I, I've seen a lot of people say it's because of the tuning, but that, that I'll, I'll always offer that that uh, counterpoint to it that hardly anything we listen to is actually at 440. Um, so I, I think the suppression came in other ways. I think we can look at Elvis in particular and see how he was. Um, his career was heading in one direction, and then his career headed off in another direction before he died. Uh, he's, a, he's a prime example of an artist who was doing really well on his own, and then yeah. he felt suppressive influence. He's, he's perfect, perfect example. Yeah, uh, that, and then that that brings us full circle to that too, as well. Yeah. Is you know, I mean, he had a, he had a suppressive for a manager, Tom Parker. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you've yeah. seen the movie, you get the picture of how bad this guy was and how how suppressed Elvis was, and he was kept in the dark on so much and and held back on anything other than how to play a guitar and, and things like that because he wanted to keep him dumb so that he could make most of the money. I mean, that's at least the apparency of it. Yeah, and then you get, then you get the modern version of it of Britney Spears, poor lady that's... Uh, yeah. We were talking about mind control and everything earlier with what Lisa mentioned. Um, and, you know, the uh, everything that, that happened to her over the last couple of decades, you can see, you know, the effects of what happens when you take somebody out of a mind control situation, it's like they go into withdrawal the same way a, a, a user of drugs or alcohol that, you know, an alcoholic will come out of withdrawal. You, you see that same thing happen when, when someone's hypnosis has been taken away from them. And, you know, you go and look at her Instagram. None of it's her fault. Um, but, you know, this, this is, again, you know, you have these artists and they've been mind controlled. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that, that's where I think the suppression comes more from is from these managers and from these entities that govern the music industry, the entertainment industry, not so much from the tuning. I've seen a lot of that, I've looked into it, I have a lot of experience with it, and, and I, I don't think that there's any suppression there specifically with the tuning, because as you know, Lisa was mentioning, loving EDM, yep, me too, all of that is for the most part at A440, and you know, it, it never MK ultraed me or anything, <laughs> uh -huh. or, or it never suppressed. It's actually, I, I really love the sound of those synthesizers. Jonathan, you were talking about the Oberheims. But, you know, it just puts me in a great thing. mood. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. And it's, there, there's something really cool. We could do a whole episode on all that. But, um, yeah, there's something very uplifting about it. There's, it's, it's very similar to orchestral music in a lot of ways. You'll find a lot of timbres, um, tonal colors. Uh, to, to not leave anybody with an MU timbre, it's spelled T-I-M-B-E-R, and it's the uh, basically tonal color the way you look at a palette of colors on, on an artist's palette, so that the timbres that uh, synthesizers create, very similar to orchestral instruments, and there, there's lots of motifs and um, techniques that the EDM folks use that are very similar to orchestral music. But anyway, going back to the suppression side of it, I, I don't think there's too much suppression with the tuning, but the industry, absolutely there is, and it's, you know, you can see it, uh, you, can, you can find evidence of it, uh, you know, just go look at Britney Spears' Instagram, 
Uh, who was the other one? Was it was it Jay Z here recently? No, there was someone else here recently who I forgot who it was. It might not have even been a musician, but somebody was coming out and uh, they they gave him a public threat, basically saying that if you keep talking that way, we're going to we're going to put you back in the control system. Do you guys recall who that was? was it was it Mel Mel Gibson was one, and he Mel, yeah, Mel Gibson was one. And there's and there's another. I want to say it was either a, a somebody who played sports or a, a rapper. I don't remember who it was. Well, uh, Nicole Kidman was another one, and Jim Caviezel was has has come out who you know has worked with Mel on 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 movies, and you know, music wise, somebody and I'm 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 bringing it back into the music band, but you know, I mean, they're all artists. You look at some of the well, ninety percent of the songs from Muse, for example. I mean, Matt, Matt Bellamy is. He's completely on board with what's going on on the planet. If you look at the lyrics and the titles of the songs, I mean, come on, <laughs> and, you know. I mean, they still have a recording contract and they're they're doing extremely well and and all of that. But I have noticed that my last favorite album of theirs was about uh, what seven eight years ago. So yeah, you, my last favorite album of theirs was uh, Black Holes and Revelations. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Two thousand and six. Exactly. Yeah, that's you know when, when he when he made the song Exopolitics. It's like what? No, <laughs> you can't talk about that. Right. Right. And, and go ahead, Lisa. Uh, okay, so I I know that um, I was just thinking about something. Um, so the whole frequency thing isn't a thing, but I. You, what's that thing that Alarage says where um, with certain music it, it makes people wrong? Oh, in the art series where he, he talks about the the with rhythm. And if somebody cannot, a, a person cannot predict a particular whatever it is rhythm, whether it's guitar, or bass, or drums, or you know the whole ensemble, mm. it makes the person wrong. And when it makes the person wrong. Like jazz makes a lot of people wrong. For example, to go to the far far left, it's not something people can easily have. So jazz is not what you would call mainstream. Now, if you listen to smooth jazz, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, smooth jazz is not really jazz. <laughs> you know, it's you know, it's 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 different. So, and that was another thing that I was going to bring up to to your point is what's the fella's name that we were talking about on YouTube who's a, a producer and a musician and he has a ton of videos and talks about... Oh, Rick Beato. Yeah, Rick Beato was talking about the death knell of the three-chord song. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that episode or not, but it's true. I, right? I've seen it. I haven't watched it. It shows up on Recommended. I'll watch that one. Yeah, yeah, because it's true. If you look at... And this is to Lisa's point, if you look at EDM, for example, EDM doesn't have three chords to it. It's the same thing through the whole quote unquote song. And I find that very interesting to what Lisa was saying as far as the, the art series reference is, you know, as long as 120 beats per minute and it's just dum, 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 you know, and she, li she, she listens to it and I'm just like, it shoot me, melody. please. And you know what? Here's, yeah. here's the funny thing. Give me thing. some 7-4. Yeah. Okay. If you want to talk about suppression, let's talk about your damn music because it makes me wrong, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, you're a different generation. And it that's, must be that. Yeah, and that's an interesting point. His mu like when he plays his music and I have to sit here, I'm just like, when is it gonna end? <laughs> it's agonizing. It really for you. is because I'm just like, it, it has no melody, it has no beauty. It's just, just I don't even know. I can't even remember it. So is is you guys in the session? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is is you know is is that is that suppression or is it a dumbing down? Of well, my, my generation to your guys's generation, where where you know I'm used to. Well, I mean you know, pop songs don't normally have odd times. I appreciate odd times. You appreciate odd times. Lisa does not appreciate odd time music, and it's not what you call mainstream. It's not even just about that though. Yeah. It's not about the times either. There's some songs that you listen to that I can clearly hear with my ears that it sounds off. 
not just the beat but the actual the, the melody or something like this guitar will just and i'm just like oh my ears yeah well the other day i was listening to that uh, makes me wrong <laughs> i was listening to um what was it the what's the song the do 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 What's, what? what's that song? <laughs> Blame it on my ADD. Oh, baby. Sale. Sale. Yeah. That's AWOL Nation. I was listening to uh, oh. his... Well, we both enjoy that song, though. Yeah, that's well, that, 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 that song is a masterpiece. But I was listening to some of his more recent stuff, which was his album before the one that came out during COVID. And she, she just asked me, point blank, she just said... You know, can you shut that off now? Because it's really, <laughs> really bothering me. And I was really surprised that she wasn't... I mean, you know, she doesn't have to get into it, so to speak. But, I mean, it, it, she found it completely unpalatable. So, you know, even artists can suppress people who don't have the same feeling about what music is. I mean, it's, it's, it's shades of suppression from the industry to the powers that be to the artist making the listener mm. wrong. Whereas, you know, his, his most popular song, anybody that listens to it, it becomes an earworm. Did you feel suppressed? Did I feel suppressed <laughs> in you saying that? Well, I mean, I felt a little invalidated because, I, you know, I want to I find that ARC where yeah. you like the same songs that I well, like. so do I. But, and uh, I like a lot of your songs, but I mean, honey, how many times do you have to listen to this, this song? <laughs> You know, I didn't blame think, it on the ADD. ADD. <laughs> anyway, so Jason, what are your thoughts? Well, I was going to say it, it is it is interesting hearing hear you guys talk about this because it's just it's one of those things where you can look at the aesthetic variation as, as far as what people consider you know what they have ARC with. It's it's it varies from person to person, even within uh, within the same generation, but. Uh, uh, we were we were talking about suppression. We were talking about music on the, the various dynamics and uh, mind control and all of that. And I think what is interesting to look at is is we do have uh, music that that has suppressed people, or excuse me, art, artists that have been suppressed within the music industry. And it's it's it, I would say it's less the music itself that suppresses people, but the artists that have been brought into it. And that, that's where I'm going with this, is I think a lot of times, however, it's not the, the individual that's being suppressed because, you know, with the music that they like, that they enjoy listening to, but where I'm going with this is the politici politicization of yeah. artists and the pushing of agendas. Yeah. Uh, so it's like the artist who's been suppressed and they, they're owned by the, by the record label. And then the people who, who listen to the music uh, don't act, aren't actively suppressed by it, but there's all these political agendas. Mm -hmm. um, that gets suppressed. And there's this one artist that I was trying to think of while you guys were talking that I can't stand. She's one of the, uh, no, what's her name? Uh, you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, she's, uh, she always wears the sweatpants and stuff. What's this girl's name? Um, oh gosh, she, 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 she has a baby voice when she sings. Uh, oh, not Eilish? Voice. Yeah, Billie Eilish. Eilish. Now, hopefully you guys don't like Billie Eilish. If you guys do, I'll, I'll shut up. He's, he loves her. I mean, I haven't listened to her most recent album yet, but, you know, the, the earlier stuff I, I really got into. I mean, you know, it's, it's familiarity with whatever music it is that it, the more you can predict it to Lisa's point on the, the art series, Thing. The, the more you listen to something, even if you didn't like it in the beginning, I didn't like Rush in 1980. I thought his voice was, Getty Lee's voice was way too high, and I found it, it really put me off. And mm -hmm. something snapped six years later, and I was, you know, hooked. Uh, Billie Eilish, I don't care for everything she does, especially her collaborations. Uh, I think Phineas is a genius. Mm -hmm. I think he's a big part of why she's so successful. But we, but to your, as far as what you were saying, what what is your disdain for her her stuff? Oh, I don't I don't want to do any invalidation or even. Oh, I'd say it's okay. I'm curious. I'm I'm really curious. Oh, I'll just a, I'll just say that uh, the um, there's a politicization again that happens with artists, and it's not her fault as an individual, but it's what she's become as it is a symbol uh, mm -hmm. a lot of artists become symbols yeah uh, they their, do their, their music is a symbol and, and then they get used 
as a uh, as a via to, to to communicate certain socio-political or at least I said religious concepts. And yeah, I, think I she, would I agree. Think she, she's she's been. What does she symbolize? Uh, I think there's something there with uh, with the destruction of uh, the woman. I think she. I think uh, she. And I, this is an evaluation on my part. I, I think that um, there's something that's that's there that's destroying the concept of what a woman is, hmm. what a female is. And is that? I, I think that there, there's. Yeah, and again, that's just totally my evaluation, and I don't mean to invalidate anybody's point of view on that. It's just merely my two cents. What makes you think that? <laughs> I, I think that um, she she is one of the tools being used uh, with the destruction of both genders, where they're pushing people towards this uh, uh, non-binary concept and, and you know the the, uh, the identification with the body rather than identification with uh, yourself as a being. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of that cult of the body, and I think she is one of the uh, this being used as a tool to push um, this, you know, uh, what's, what, what, what can we use as a term for that? It's not agenda? Uh, well, yeah, it's an agenda, but, uh, but the, the type of the agenda, I'm trying to put a name on it without sounding terrible. Um, <laughs> uh, just, yeah, the, uh, the, the non-binary agenda, the, uh, the, the, the querying of genders and all of that. I, I think she is being used for that, uh, where, you know, the concept of being a mother, the concept of being, you know, a, you're a woman, all of that is being um, blurred. Blurred and also uh, suppressed. I, I look at I, I look at someone like her, and, and I don't see an uplifted woman. I don't see someone like you know. You, even we, we take some of the uh, the country singers and female female country singers and female pop singers. They seem like they're they're uplifted individuals. And you look at Billie Eilish, and she seems like she's very beat down and just not like a um, not not like a, an empowered woman. So that's where I'm going with that. It seems like there's those lines there where they're they're trying to push uh, both genders towards the center of having no male and no female. Okay, and do you see this in her music, in her lyrics? Um... Uh, whole concept, not necessarily in the music itself, but what she is more more what she is being used as a symbol, not her as an individual. I don't know her as an individual, but just looking at her. As a, uh, the way that they use her as a, as a as a product. So in the in the marketing end of things. Uh, yeah, whole concept though. Looking looking at music, uh, yeah. videos, performances, aesthetic, yeah. clothing, makeup. Yeah, you know, you, yeah. You you see that you see that a lot where they really don't have any a whole hell of a lot of say unless they're really top shelf. You know, I mean, they're making bank to where they can say, look, this isn't something I want to do. And, and you know, I mean, you, you take your career into your own hands in some cases. I mean, there's very few artists, musical artists, there's, there's very few artists at all these days. They all have to be careful, especially after the, the uh, canceling thing as to what they say and what they do. And, you know, they many an artist has backtracked on something they've said. I mean, they can't backtrack on what they've done, but they do backtrack on what they say once somebody says, you know, either either their managers or their handlers or their record company or, 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 or say, look, you know, this is, this could hurt your career. Wink, wink, wink. I don't know if, if, if Billy deals with that. I mean, she, Christ, she's what, 19, 20, something she's like young. that. I don't she's know. pretty young, but you know, I think the idea, the whole idea is, is make as much money as you can, don't spend it and keep it safe and then make your, give your opinions. I mean, you know, people have said for years to Michael Stipe and R.E.M. and um, Bono from U2, shut up and sing, mm -hmm. you know, because, yeah. because they were yeah. so political. Yeah. Uh, Bru I, Bruce Springsteen too. too. Yeah. Lisa? There's uh, we're, we're, oh, what about this okay, um, I was just going to say that, yeah, that definitely does happen. And there's always, I actually don't think like you can make enough money to avoid it. I think the more money you make, the more chance of them trying to suppress you in some way and use you and do your bidding. I mean, I think it's kind of weird. I don't know if you guys know about the Selena, Justin and Hayley Bieber drama. But um, 
it's kind of weird that there's flying saucers, <laughs> there's um, spy balloons from China, there's uh, train derailments all over the place. It's all this stuff and then suddenly, boom, Selena Gomez and, ha and Hailey Bieber are having it out and Kylie Jenner's involved and all this stuff. I mean, I, I've always liked Selena, but I don't think they are um, above who's ever, whoever is suppressing them. I mean, I, I think they're being used to try and manipulate the thing because i promise you like my tiktok is just filled with that stuff like mm -hmm. tonight when i go look i mean you know yeah it's just it's you know there's no more trend derailment stuff no more yeah. balloon stuff so if they can't stop it if they can't um ban it what they'll try and do is just keep flooding it with crap that's actually irrelevant yeah yeah well they use they they use the the artist's whatever walk of art that they are they use them as sort of like the look at this dancing monkey and how strange it's behaving isn't this interesting because it's something people are familiar with and they know that they can capture a lot of people's attention mm -hmm. with you know look at what the dancing monkey is is doing now i mean i don't mean to belittle the, these artists i mean you don't see it with um fine art artists or orchestras or, or conductors or anything like that. I mean, when's the last time a conductor got in the, the 24 hour news cycle about <laughs> something they had done, but within popular culture is when they, they tend to parade them out and they, they put up a, and you know, we could, that's a whole other podcast, which we've talked about before. They put up a sacrifice and take somebody down in, in order to, misdirect distract or sacrifice somebody for some other purpose and i mean and that's a whole other again another podcast on the um what they do to artists regardless of their stature or how long they've been around if if, if somebody serves the purposes of the people that have the most money that's that's the ultimate suppression yeah <clears throat> a lot of times these uh, personas of these artists are dreamed up before that person is even selected uh, to be Lady Gaga or Billie Eilish or whomever it happens to be. Like just taking uh, Lady Gaga for example, uh, her as a as a musician um, was her own thing before she ever became Lady Gaga, and that template of her as an artist was there before they even picked her to be. Uh, what's what's her actual name? Stephanie Germanotti. Mm -hmm. that her actual... Something like that. So she yeah, would, yeah uh, they they already had Lady Gaga picked about. Uh, developed before they picked her to become Lady Gaga, for instance. So I imagine that we're going back to Billie Eilish. I imagine that's the concept there. Her and Phineas, her and her brother, uh, tremendously talented kids, um, and then you know the whatever whatever uh, valence or persona that they they developed for her, they you know they put it on a plate. So you can see that with a lot of artists where they're you know they sign these non disclosure agreements, and you'll never hear the actual actual story. Even with the the Stephanie Germanotti story, it's like there's the story of Lady Gaga, and then there's the official story of Stephanie Germanotti turning into Lady Gaga, and then there's what actually happened. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and she's she's had a lot of trouble with uh, the dark arts and things like that, and things that, that have, I mean, she's been on interviews on TV, she articles, written articles, things she said on stage, you know, calling, passing out on stage and call, saying, you know, I, I can't continue on, master, and things like that. I mean, it's just, just, just what? Mm. It's, so, you know, I mean, the artist, unfortunately, the way it seems, at least, the apparency is that artists are constantly up for offer on, uh, you know, the, 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 the bigger picture, the bigger agenda, the, the, the lower tone beings that are running the planet because, well, the music industry is pretty much run by from people that I've talked to on the inside is run by the mafia mm -hmm. that ha actually have recording contracts. You know, I mean, these are well-known individuals and they've said, yeah, it's run by the mafia. And if, if you get a 360 deal, take it and sell as many t-shirts as you can at your concert. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the only way you can make money as a recording artist when, when you've got things like uh, Spotify where they make less than pennies on a, a, a song. It's, that's the ultimate suppression. I mean, it's it's hard to make money as a as a recording artist these days. 
right? You got me yeah, thinking. The industries aren't even. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry, um, you got me thinking now that you were talking. You guys were talking about Lady Gaga about. Um, I think her name's Zendaya mm-hmm. uh, from Euphoria. Mm-hmm. I think it's Euphoria, right? Mm-hmm. On Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that whole song, I want to dance, dance, dance with my hands, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think that, you know, I can't be sure, but I think, no, I don't actually know if that was by Lady Gaga or not, but it, I think it might have been. Mm-hmm. Um, but the lyrics is just so something that she would write, um, or at least the people around her would. Mm-hmm. And it's it's very, I find it so weird the, when you think about the the suppression stuff and how they use biblical things especially yeah it's it's and, and the illuminati and all yeah. this stuff and the, the, the agendas yeah. yeah yeah and it's it's so strange for me um because you know in a time where i think that a lot of people are trying well a lot of these bigger things are trying to um make it so that there's no religion or, or, or nothing to believe in and stuff that they still do that kind of thing it's almost as if um i read a conspiracy theory about them actually trying to mimic a second coming yeah to um, push the stream of consciousness in in that direction right no? yeah we've talked about that before on other podcasts jason yeah <laughs> yeah that's that stuff at least that's really interesting that stuff that you're talking about where they do use um Biblical archetype stuff to try to push that agenda forward, and I don't want to get anything any anything confidential about all that. But we could go on a, a whole private conversation about that sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wouldn't be the first time in this universe that sort of thing has happened. Yeah, there was one other thing that I wanted to mention about the Euphoria show as well. Um, is that okay? So when it first came out, um, I actually sustained an injury. And I was basically bedridden for a few days. And so I decided, well, I've got nothing else to do. Might as well look on Netflix for something to binge watch. And um, by the way, binge binge watching, especially amongst teenagers, is actually like a a big deal. Um, And I'll mention why in a sec. But um, so there I was binging. I wasn't working or anything because at that point in time... um, you know, it was just too painful to do anything. So I decided to watch Euphoria, see what it was all about. And I, I got a little bit hooked. Um, but that wasn't the big problem. The big problem was how I actually felt after watching it. Um, we were talking about how music makes one feel and stuff. And you were saying, Jason, how, uh, you know, pictures. Well, pictures as well as, um, like videos you know they matter it, it makes it, it makes a person feel a certain way and now this main character um who I, I can't remember what her name is in the show but i know as zendaya she um portrays this girl who does drugs and who um you know like is is an addict is an alcoholic she'll do anything for her next fix and all of that stuff and i just at the end of it i'm not gonna lie i kind of felt that valence come on to me a little bit where you know i don't know if you've ever watched this movie but like watched a movie and then afterwards felt like yeah i can do that and you you know were like maybe you watched an action movie and and you were quicker than usual on your feet or something you were just you know in action but after watching that i I felt so um and i'm talking quite a few hours of watching it right because like i said i was i had an injury but i just felt so much like the character um, and now you've got to think to yourself the effect of that kind of thing on teens where mm-hmm. they go into that valence. Who are malleable. Yeah. And the thing is, this was a teen show. Mm-hmm. And I think, if I remember correctly, the age restriction was 13. Mm-hmm. On HBO. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, uh, and I know that uh, most of this conversation was supposed to be about how the industry uses artists, but that's just another way that. Um, not only are they using artists, but they're also, you know, distributing like to a whole broad um, audience. Demographic. Th- yeah, that 
you know, this is how you should be. I mean, I don't even want to know the statistics of how many people actually started using drugs from because that from that show yeah. because yeah. it's cool. I mean, there was yeah. this, there was one girl, right? She had body issues. She was overweight, mm -hmm. and um, she actually started doing uh, porn. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just mind blowing that this stuff is okay to show teenagers. Right. Here's an idea, kids. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's nasty after watching that show too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And 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 then they push it as you know it's the most popular thing. Well, you know, kids, I, I got a message for you. Just because it's popular, doesn't mean it's good for you. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, and it's the same thing with the internet. Just because it's on the internet doesn't make it true. Reliable sources count. Is it a reliable source? No. Something written by a group of people that have an agenda to make you feel a certain way and do certain things to make you more controllable. Sorry, that's my viewpoint. Not a good idea. Just because it's on TV, just because it's in music, just because your favorite artist does something doesn't make it okay. And we need to ask really the question is why? Why are these things popular? Because I have seen independent Bank artists. Agreement. <laughs> no, that's the thing. I completely disagree. I used to think it was that. No. But I think it's more a case of them pushing it. Because well, I've known yeah. independent artists yeah. and, and, and I've watched independent films and stuff and it's great, it's magnificent, it's amazing and it really looks like quality. But if you don't have the right people pushing it forward, you're not going to make sales, you're not going to get it out there. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it is. Yeah, it's well, not it's, what you know, it's who you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that the, the more shocking it is, the more likely you are to get get subscribers to get viewers to get listeners to get things sold and i mean you know we've been seeing that for decades i mean you know elvis elvis was called elvis the pelvis because he gyrated his pelvis on stage <laughs> and they considered it uh, it's almost sacrilegious that he was up up there swinging his pelvis around because it looked like a sexual act and they were they were banning it or when john lennon said you know we're bigger than jesus now they were burning beatles records I mean, you know, it it never stops on, and 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 then the Beatles, the Beatles sold even more records after that. After people burned their records, because any attention is better than no attention. There is no such thing as bad press. Right, but my thing is that if you originate like from the ground, like look, if you're a star and you put out a new song, you it's fine. Like the whole world's gonna know about it. Mm -hmm. But if you aren't anything yet and you're trying to get something out there mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy mm -hmm. you have to be outrageous no i'm saying that it doesn't matter how outrageous you are if you don't have the, the companies the big to push people it. to push it well true it's not gonna right go anywhere. right and they have the they they have their agenda i mean this the, the latest sam smith song to go back to him mm -hmm. that unholy song yeah i think it's a bunch of shit and yet sorry for my language and yet it's just it was it was all over and then it was yeah. played ironically in the what was it the grammys mm -hmm. or the super bowl or something i, I can't remember mm -hmm. um and yeah i mean what was that about it it wasn't a good song no no, but it was everywhere. But I mean, you know, that's that's how they do it. Is now they use TikTok as a platform to get the latest song out there. They did that with uh, Lizzo's. Yeah. So I mean, they do it all yeah. the time. I mean, now it's okay. But that it's, song was awesome. <laughs> the, the, and then Miley Cyrus's song, you know that. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, they really I'm do that. Mama, the more times it's heard, the more people get an earworm. The more people want to want to buy the album or buy the track or listen to it on Spotify. Sorry, Jason, I didn't mean to drop you out of all of this. Okay, speaking of track, I was going to say, would you guys agree tech-wise that, that we're talking about aesthetic traps here, right? Theta traps? The yeah, way to, of course. Yeah. Of course, right. absolutely. I mean, it's... What you guys were saying, you guys were both saying the same thing, essentially, when you were asking Lisa about, Jonathan, when you were asking Lisa about uh, bank agreement and everything, and then Lisa said it's, you know, you, people have to push it, and I'd say you guys are both right, and that's that's how you make a theta trap, right? You, uh, or pull trap even, mm. um, but, you, but you're getting beings pulled in, and, and like you were saying, Lisa, earlier, the, the thing about uh, 
it only being about the sexual side of the second dynamic and everything. I mean, mm-hmm. how many songs are there about, like, on the second dynamic about children? <laughs> you know, how many how many songs written in the last few decades can we think about, like, actually about out having children? Right. Right. R- yeah. R- right. Yeah. There, there's even a creator on uh, on TikTok, the creepy, cringy lyric series, where he, <laughs> I love that where, 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 where he, he, he takes songs and he plays them and he puts the lyrics on at the bottom as a caption. And then, I mean, you just go, wait a minute, that's pedophilia. And it's over and over and over and over and over and over that, that these, it's mentioned in these songs. And you never think twice about it because you don't know what the lyrics are or you mishear the lyrics or whatever. But it's incredible how much of that stuff is in there and, and the innuendo that's, that's buried in this stuff, especially in the, the rock genre, I hate to say. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And that, so, you know, there's varying, you know, to, to kind of wrap this whole thing up, there's varying degrees of suppression. Uh, you know, the artists are suppressed and they become depraved because of, of the, the, the stress that they're put under, whether it's, uh, it's from the recording industry themselves or the touring or, and they, they, they end up going down dark paths, it seems to me. And they, they start doing things and saying things that, well, are um, low-toned. That, that's, that's my take on it, at least. I don't I mean the artists are bad, but they, the artists, they're so darn suppressed, they just don't have any other direction to go except in that direction in, in many cases. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think so, too. Um, while you were talking, I was also thinking to myself, um, if the managers and the producers and all of these people are the bad guys and they're you know saying do this do that that that's what sells or whatever i've always imagined there to be one higher that we just don't know because um lrh says that the suppressive is usually hidden right so i've i maybe it's just a conspiracy theory but i've always imagined there to be other people other beings or whatever that were higher up that were truly controlling the show Mm -hmm. and um because you know you can you can find out who produces the stuff and Mm -hmm. and and whatever really easily but who's above that Mm -hmm. who pays for these people and a lot of the time it'll link back to very rich families i think Mm -hmm. i was talking to uh a gentleman who knows the story behind the B-52's Love Shack. And I didn't, I had no idea. I mean, who, who doesn't know that song? I had no idea. Me? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he did. Well, it came out, I think it came out before you were born or right around the time you were born. I had no idea, but that song is about a place where everybody goes to have an orgy. Wow. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, had, I was I was like what and he goes yeah yeah that's what that's that's what they wrote the lyrics about and he would know I can't say why but he would know so you know it's is, is it I mean you know hey whatever you do on the second dynamic is whatever you do on the second dynamic but um, you know there's varying degrees of this stuff and, and you, buyer beware you have to be able to Look at the information, look at the lyrics, look at the, the, what's going on on the planet and, and do your due diligence to, in order to digest the, the, this information. And, and it's not always what you think it is, is the music might be fine, but the intent behind it, the, the artistry in a painting or why this person, I mean, you know, was it Van Gogh that did a self-portrait of him with his ear cut off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's so it's it's a funny planet, and artists are really suppressed, and they they want to express themselves, and there's nothing wrong with them expressing themselves in whatever way. But but when you start being the poster child for pedophilia or, or self maiming, okay, is this a good thing? But who's the judge? Who should be the judge? Should any be anybody be judging it? I I, I don't know. But uh, it's a wacky world, and they all need auditing. That's my opinion. We could actually have a complete second um, podcast on just the subject of suppressives in the music industry yeah. alone. Not yeah. even just in the, I mean, in the celeb industry, like just like 
all across, you know, uh, music and actors and stuff. I mean, what mm-hmm. was that thing we saw last night with that guy? Yeah, the thing with Jim, Jim Cavizio. Um, about what was that word that they use? Oh, it had to do with the adrenaline. A- adrenochrome, I think. Uh, yeah, adrenochrome having it uh, with. I mean, this is really dark. Dark shit. shit. Dark <laughs> shit. The d- adrenochrome in children that know they're going to die and that they're they're siphoning it off of these children before they kill them. I'm I'm sorry, this is really low tone yeah. stuff, but it it isn't isn't something that I'm interested in, but. It's something that people need to be aware of that there are some very, very dark people in the in the movie industry that do this stuff, uh, and I, the, the it's f- it's too prevalent to not be the case based off of all of the people that have come forward, from Corey Feldman to Jim Caviezel to uh, Mel Gibson to I mean you uh, uh, Nicole Kidman on and on and on. Chris, no, not Chris Rock. What's that other guy? Um. We sometimes watch him, comedian, black guy. Uh, oh, Dave Chappelle? Yeah. He, yeah. he also mentions the industry and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, it, it's, it's one of those things that um, they have to be careful on the things that they say because, well, I mean, I was just watching, I was just watching uh, looking at Facebook the other day, Steve Stevens, the guitar player for Billy Idol put a post up and on Facebook and said he he said I thought it was common knowledge that that you had to make a literal deal with the devil in your recording contract. He was serious. He was serious about this. He thought it was common knowledge. Doesn't everybody know this that these the 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 the, the industry is rife with this sort of thing? I mean we could we could have a second podcast on this. We should talk yeah. about this at length. Anyway, not Oh, you know, that's right. Go ahead, Jason. I was going to say that, yeah, we should do another part because there's, there's a whole other part of this that I meant to bring up that it, it's, it's too late in this podcast now to start talking about, but it's something we could open up with the next one uh, on the same subject, and that's this concept that artists are led to believe that they have to suffer in order to create good art. Yeah, we didn't, right, we didn't, yeah. we didn't get to that part of it, so yeah. They're, that, that could be a whole other thing where yeah. that's, that's kind of like the, the initial implant, the, the basic on the track of the artist, they yeah. hold that, and they go around looking for that suffering, and, and by the time they found it, they're washed out, so right. we'll do that on part two. Yeah, we'll do that on part two. That'll be an interesting one. Yeah, definitely. So, well, it's been a, a, a wild ride, and we covered a lot of... Uh, varying degrees on this but there are still more degrees on the compass that we we need to address in another podcast uh we all appreciate you listening um we'll be back with a second podcast on this probably week after next uh you have any last things to say yeah i just want to say i don't just watch tiktok it's not doesn't consume my day (laughs) (laughs) jason oh no just uh thank you both lisa and jonathan this has been always great to do podcasts and work with you too um I definitely look forward to the next podcast. Me too. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) Thanks for being here, guys. And thank you to all of our listeners. We'll see you next week talking about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and what it means for independent Scientology. Take care, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Subscribe.